So it's no secret that over the last six or seven years, Christchurch has gained a reputation as something of a street art city, <clears throat> even speech, uh, featured in the Lonely Planet's recent street art guide alongside more traditionally recognised hotspots. But what is a street art city? In many ways, this question is tied to the very definition of street art, which seemingly means different things to different people. A nebulous term since its inception, it has evolved over the years, encompassing expanding practices, tactics, and forums, and importantly, signifying a changing relationship between civic authority and an artistic culture born of rebellion. While originally referring to art made in the streets without permission, today, street art is often popularly defined by the rise of contemporary muralism. Cities have embraced the transformative attraction of large-scale wall paintings, and when people use the term street art in common conversation, they're often referring to the murals that increasingly adorn walls around the globe, and not only the expected metropolises, but also settings as diverse as tropical Tahiti, pristine Dubai, tiny Stavanger, the Norwegian township which hosts one of the world's most significant street art festivals, and everywhere in between. Close to the home, the likes of Dunedin, Tauranga and Hamilton have also utilised muralism and mural festivals to enliven the urban spaces and expand their cultural profiles. Of course, following this trend, front and centre of Christchurch's status as a street art city have been the array of impressive large-scale murals produced by various local, national and international artists. These additions have been vibrant, thoughtful and transformative, altering the built environment and even the emotional air of the city and creating new waves of street art fans along the way. Visiting, local, visiting and local artists have adorned the city's walls with large portraits of unsung heroes or everyday residents, with giant schematic plans echoing those needed for the rebuild, with a cycling gang of peddling misfits, with dense, nightmarish psychological landscapes, a swirling calligraphic vortex of light, a massive ballerina elegantly rising from a gravelly lot, and even bulky pachyderms wading amongst a sea of graffiti monikers. Each has served as a reflective response to the unique experience of the contemporary city, always couched within the artist's signature styles. Yet while murals such as Askew One's portraits exploring cultural migration, Roa's monochromatic moa skeleton, or more recently Spanish artist Amparito's giant, delightfully unexpected yellow pillow have been rightfully celebrated, they also reveal only some of the potential of urban art and only some of the performances of the full spectrum of urban art in Christchurch's drawn-out period of recovery. Indeed, in the shadow cast by the city's impressive murals, it is easy to forget the role surprising, smaller, subversive interventions have played in the constantly changing post-disaster cityscape, and in the emergence of Christchurch's reputation as a street art city. Playing on a more intimate experience of the city, and not necessarily seeking the permission and platforms afforded official projects, They've provided people with the opportunity to reflect on their relationship with the surrounding environment, at times evident in their explicit message, at other times implied by their modes of production and dissemination. Intrepid artists have reimagined, questioned and challenged the city's form, prodding an unsuspecting public audience to contemplate the complexities of the surrounding environment, even if not requiring complicit agreement around the transgressive tactics employed, or even the visual content of their interventions. In the post-quake landscape, the presence of graffiti, of paste-ups and paintings, of stickers, stencils and sculptures, alongside and in some cases over the top of large-scale murals, has made Christchurch's relationship with street art more layered and perhaps more meaningful. In fact, contemporary muralism in its historical lineage might be best understood not when replacing unsectioned interventions, but when juxtaposed amongst them. In Christchurch, graffiti writers have bombarded empty and abandoned buildings inside and out, enthralling or abhorring depending on your view a combination of creative misbehaviour and urban exploration, venturing to places we assume off-limits, inaccessible or useless. Ultimately, graffiti is also indivisible from its eradication. Both graffiti writing and the patches of grey paint covering them represent a battle for expression, where competing voices talk over one another, a relevant and vital concept in a city where the consultation process has been continuous and contentious. Other interventions have been more outward-looking, Giant sticking plasters have covered cracking and crumbling buildings. Stencil artists have sprayed whimsical suggestions of play, poetry about wonky houses, or simply invitations to look again. Painted or pasted characters have acted out the exploration of the city, figurative stand-ins for vanished artists, reaching for places most real bodies see no reason to be, encouraging the potential to navigate new routes. Guerrilla sculptors have installed unofficial signs, mocking, uh, mocking the number of empty lots capitalised as car parks. 
Stickers have provided alternatives to the abundance of ordinance signs or simply altered their appearance. Placards and posters have critiqued politicians. Installations have invited the recollection of changed and broken spaces. And written phrases have captured momentary conversations, inviting participation with a disappeared confidant. And in each case, the viewer becomes part of the performance. <laughs> These types of urban art interventions serve to activate not only the space they occupy, but also the unexpected viewer who stumbles across them. Yet, these types of interventions are now seemingly less prevalent across the city. Obviously, the progress of the rebuild has ensured the types of spaces previously commandeered are less numerous, and perhaps the explicit quake commentaries are less pressing. But the new, less broken Christchurch, with shiny, glass-fronted buildings, still presents a landscape for guerrilla artists to react and respond to. The potential for urban art to engage with the realities of the city remains, importantly in a different manner from the murals that have been co-opted to serve as symbols of the recovery. As a city changes, the tactics and messages for questioning its evolution must too. The Quake experience showed the potential of art in the streets to serve not only as an activation and transformation, but as a challenge, a critique, and a reflection. And whilst the discussion may have changed somewhat, the need for that discussion remains, because to borrow from an anonymous scribe, the city continues to provoke us.